it's not easy to penetrate the power structure. Vanessa Glushevsky served as deputy comptroller for the city of Buffalo and got a behind-the-scenes look at how the power structure operates when she sought to be appointed to the post. First off, tell us where we are. What's the significance of this place to this city and to you? We are in Martin Luther King Park, and it's a significant landmark in the city. We have this huge statue behind us that has caused some controversy in the past, but it's still great. Uh, there's a huge jazz festival that's significant to the African-American community that happens. The Juneteenth Parade happens, which was just this past weekend. <laughs> If anything, the history of Dr. Martin Luther King reminds us that making change is not easy. Yeah. The power establishment does not shift magically of its own accord. Mm -hmm. You had that experience yourself. I did. Talk about it. Um, so recently, I was a candidate for the city comptroller position. It was vacant after Mark Schroeder went on to become the commissioner of the DMV. And so I was already in City Hall because he had named me, named me as Deputy Comptroller before he left. So once he left, I took over as Acting Comptroller and was working full time and running a campaign uh, and simultaneously fighting City Hall, <laughs> really, because I was not the chosen one to run for the seat. As someone who was not endorsed by the party, it was extremely difficult, but you know, we really, we gave it all, our all, and I'm happy to say that like over 40 people volunteered to carry my petition, and we got over 2,000 signatures, which we had, a, we had we were meeting a benchmark of 1,500. So we did the best we could, but at the end of the day, um, you know, to to fight City Hall, we really just needed more than that. Today's progressive candidates aren't running in a vacuum. A progressive coalition calling itself Our City came together across issue groups recently to draw up a nine-point platform for inclusive development. Now they're calling on all of Buffalo's politicians to commit to it. John Washington, Asim Johnson, and Harper Bishop were there at the birth. So wait, this was a train terminal? Uh, we are at the Central Terminal in the Broadway Fillmore neighborhood. Uh, this is a neighborhood that has experienced a lot of divestment over the years since the terminal has been out of use. You know, this is one of the places where we really started thinking about um, building a coalition, an intersectional coalition to build political power to, you know, shift the dynamics that we were dealing with in our organizing in Buffalo. This neighborhood is not gonna be the same once a, de a developer yeah. is found for this terminal. One way that it can go is a concentration of power and wealth and that outside developers come in and they continue to hoard that, that wealth. Or it's a place where community control and community wealth is going to be built. I was very passionate about creating a holistic narrative for the city of Buffalo in regards to gentrification. Understand that gentrification, for one, is a problem, it's not an issue. The issues underlining uh, gentrification are things like um, lack of, of access to quality housing, quality education, uh, jobs, um, the environment, and working to really be in coalition with organizations who have a focus on those particular issues and how can we together create this holistic narrative. What were you doing before this? So before this, I was actually with the Coalition for Economic Justice. That's how the three of us all actually met. At the time, Harper's with Open Buffalo, John with Push, and uh, Open Buffalo actually convened a table called the High Road Economic Development Table. Um, and in so many ways, I guess you could say, our city kind of was birthed from that, mm -hmm. you know, because we were all at the table anyway. It was just more so, I'm like, we got to take this a step further. We were advised by so many people to actually pick one issue and to focus in on it. So many people told us that, and as John said, we don't, we live intersectional lives, and so there's so many people that come into spaces, including all of us, that live a very intersectional life. And I was really inspired by, well, mulling that over, I went to Washington, D.C. It was a kickoff for the Poor People's Campaign and heard Dr. Reverend Barber speak, and he said, uh, so do the powers that be, do developers, do corporations ask for one thing? No, they don't ask for one thing. They ask for as much as they can, whenever they want, for you know, as long as they want. And we need to start having the same audacity to say that we are no longer going to just say one thing and, and feel like we have to beg for that one thing that actually we deserve and our communities deserve 
all of these things um, and their human rights. Uh, we have a very like white male led culture in nonprofits that says like, let's just go in the neighborhood and tell everybody what the solution is instead of like, let's get real about the connections of the problems because everybody is talking about individual problems. And even if people are not working with us or they're working in their silos, it's clear that gentrification is the root cause. And so like, that's something I'm proud of is people who I don't really like and don't want to work with, but they're clear that the root cause is gentrification and that narrative actually helps their work too and so it's not about us being the right people you know we have we have automation we have climate change we have inflation we have these like forces that are going to kill us all buffalo is like the number two climate migration zone in the country and i feel like you know what i mean we have like my kids and their kids like for their existence on this planet and then in space in this city like we have to establish that like our youth are really what is central to this movement because they they have to build a bigger and better and stronger movement than we did and we have to give them the tools to do that while we're building ours. The way that we look and the, ref the reflection of uh, folks it, I think is like as John said is going to be incredibly diverse. I as a trans man have a very different experience and to have queer and trans voices at the table and decision making is actually extraordinary in a town like Buffalo and so that adds to it. We've had women and gender non-conforming queer trans people, multi-generational multicultural um, and so it has been incredibly diverse and we're extremely proud of that. What if our cities put people not profits first? In Buffalo almost a thousand residents took part in a six-month community planning process that came up with a nine-point vision. Their city they said is a city where investing in the future means investing in quality public education first where immigrants are not only welcome, but protected and cherished and safe. Where everyone has access to health and affordable housing, and the most in need are helped to the first. Where demographics don't determine life outcomes. And the local economy is developed by, with, and for local people. A city where the arts and cultural institutions are prized and thrive, where police protect and serve and public safety is a function of public well-being. Where public transportation works for everyone. And the money the city spends on food helps create healthy, happy lives. It's our city, they say. We have a right to it. But to make it real, our city needs our government.